What's up, everyone? We are about to go live in uh, the next minute or so. We're just letting our notifications go out to YouTube land, and we're going to be talking all about orthotics and uh, flat feet and all the things that you want to know about them. So stick around. So you want to know about the structure and function of your foot and whether you need orthotics or not. Well, in today's episode, we're going to take a deep dive into this and we're going to talk about some of the um, not commonly known ways of how to avoid orthotics or how to get out of them and make sure that your feet are stronger than ever. Make sure you stick around to the end because we're going to answer some really good questions and also talk about the biggest mistakes that people make when training their feet to prevent ever being in orthotics. All that and more coming up. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image. Hey everyone, in case we haven't met, my name's Rad Burmeister. I'm the co-founder of Unity Gym and co-creator of the Unify Movement System, or UMS, where we take driven people and turn them into superhumans, make them super strong and super flexible. Now, we get such astonishing results with our members because we've created a program that has a balance between strength and flexibility. If you want to know how we do that, then the best way to get started is to download the free flexibility blueprint. There's a link in the uh, description of this video. Now, as always, I've got uh, Phil White with me. He's our resident physiotherapist and all-around good guy. How are you doing today, Phil? Very well, very well. I'm uh, still not quite recognizing myself when I yeah. see a reflection, yeah, but hopefully my little CDMO will start to come through for Movember <laughs> uh, sooner rather than later. So. Yep. <laughs> yep, so then you've got an excuse for uh, for looking 10 years younger. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I feel like a total baby face. Movember is not an international thing, is it? I think Movember is yeah, international. Yeah, and he's asking maybe if Movember those, is an international uh, thing Maybe those in the US, give us a yeah, shout Yeah, if anyone's uh, watching, if look, if anyone's watching the show, as always, hit the like button and uh, comment with your name and where you're watching from. But also, can you let us know, is Movember a thing in your country where you're from, or is it just an Australian? thing we want to know yeah because right, we want to know if uh, you know we're leading the way or just following everybody yeah. else in the world and if you're feeling extra generous you can jump onto my Instagram hit the link in the bio and donate a bit of money towards a really good cause of uh yeah, men's health. So. Mm -hmm, yeah. so this uh, today's show and this whole week of discussion has come about for some really good questions on our UMS online coaching or UMS uh, Movement Mastermind Facebook group where all of our online members uh, can interact with each other, ask questions and get coaching from us. And there's been some really good questions about orthotics and as to whether somebody with flat feet needs them and it's led us to this show. So the key discussion points for today, let's go into the first one, which is really diff the difference between active and passive structures of the feet. Yeah, so as I've gone through with pretty much every other um, joint in the body that we've talked about so far, like I don't know why it seems like some people just have in their minds that like the feet are sort of separate and don't follow the same rules, but you've got so many structures in your foot that are um, there to provide like um, structure both passive, so with ligaments you've got 
30, oh, 112 different ligaments, so they're passive structures that hold the bones to the other bones. So you've got 112 ligaments in the ankle and the foot, and then you've also got obviously muscles that control the foot as well. And there's some really clever things that happen with your plantar fascia as well, the, um, which is sort of the connect tissue sheath that runs from your heel all the way up to, um, I guess, the front of your foot, and then has a connection into your big toe that um, it's a, it, it helps control um, the system. So when you're loading it, uh, when you're pushing off, you've got a really nice rigid structure, but then when you're landing, you've got a nice sort of soft and mobile structure. So you, the foot is so clever, and it's got all these mechanisms that it can um, really effectively shock absorb, balance, and um, produce force. So. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's it's quite amazing, isn't it? And like, mm. as um, can you explain for what the main difference between active and passive structures yeah, is, so and especially what it means with the foot? For sure. So again, any uh, the active structures is going to be your muscles, and then uh, tendons. So mu tendons are what uh, attaches a muscle to a bone. So those are things that you can contract. Um, on purpose and, and yeah exactly and um, strain and easily they're elastic well, yeah not ideally not easily but yeah, you can build them up and, and they Com can be comparatively to other uh, to say ligaments though right? yeah, yeah yeah depending though uh, it's yeah. pretty easy to roll your ankle and um, yeah. and and hurt the ligament there because of the leverage so, involved so, yeah something and then the the, pa the passive Pass structure is going to be your bone your ligaments your cartilage and those connective yeah. tissues so something that when I became a new personal trainer um, 16 years ago something that helped me to really sort of wrap my head around how ligaments and tendons and muscles are different is that, um, the, as Phil just said, the active structures are what creates movement and the passive structures are what um, keeps the structure strong. Ligaments are the connective tissue between the bones and they're not elastic at all. They don't give. So when you put too much strain on a ligament, they're very, very strong though. They're much stronger than tendons and muscles. But when they, when you put too much strain on them, they tear or completely snap like a, a full tear, which is what happened to me in my foot. I tore the Liggs Frank ligament, which connects the big toe to the second toe right about there on the top here. And that was a complete tear. So it snapped. And the only way to, re to fix my foot, or at least the, um, the best option that I believed and that the surgeons believed was to put a screw in there and hold it back together. So would that be a, a, a good layman ex description? Um, of yeah, I'd say that there and is like, and ligaments? yes, absolutely. But there is like a little bit of give attendance, I mean, sorry, with ligaments when you, they like depending on the person as well, some people are very, uh, I guess their ligaments are um, very taut and mm -hmm. they uh, keep everything pretty close packed and um, other people like myself are a bit more hypermobile, so you can mm -hmm. kind of get it a bit more sort of yep. pliability. And so when uh, women go through pregnancy, the h hormones that they have are a hormone called relaxin, which I think is a great it's name. For it. like it? <laughs> the, the hormone that makes women more flexible when they're pregnant yeah. is called relaxin. Oh, relaxin. <laughs> so <laughs> that, up that, that can change the uh, laxity within ligaments. So it is, it's not just a like, it's, you know, masking tape across, like it, it does have some mm, give yeah. to it, but when it does go, then you have, um, you know, it, it can be graded tears, so like a little bit or totally, but they're um, generally when you they heal back together, they're never quite as yeah. rigid as they were to begin with. So if you rolled your ankle once, you probably rolled it quite yeah. a few times. So let's move into the second key discussion point for today, which is the key difference between toe and sole crunching. We've been having a bit of a joke about this. Uh, yeah, the uh, sole, sole crunch. crunching. I like it. <laughs> um, but basically, so when you're looking at the foot, um, as I talked about before, it's like there's so many uh, bones and ligaments all holding it together that you've got. Um, three different arches in your foot. So you've got uh, the medial longitudinal arch, so coming along the inside of your foot. You've got the lateral longitudinal arch going on the outside of your foot, and then you've also got a transverse arch. So you've got these arches in place, and when you think about you know, the strongest, uh, it's, it's the strongest structure you can think of with, with a bridge. They're built in arches because they're really um, good at taking um, right. load and force. Uh, so you, the foot is so clever because it does have this ability to take a lot of force through there. When you go into, um, uh, when you're pushing off your toes and your, your big toe bends back like that, that causes that uh, connective tissue sheath that I was talking about, from, which goes from your toe all the way down to your heel to tighten. And what that does is it, it draws those bones together and sort of lifts up through your arch. Mm -hmm. Now you've also got, I think, 13 muscles outside of, your, um, uh, of the foot itself and then 21 muscles within it, all working to maintain the arch, uh, position your ankle in a way that it's gonna be nice and balanced and stable. 
and um, and give you really good support there. So how that comes down to the difference between sole crunching and, and the toe crunching is often when people do foot strengthening exercises, they're always um, just going in as if you were doing this with your hands, but with your feet. So yeah, just yeah. Uh, clawing yeah. your toes together, which is a nice way of getting some of those intrinsic muscles of your foot, so the muscles that sit within your foot um, to strengthen up. But the um, the ideal way to strengthen up that arch is actually by trying to create that longitudinal mm -hmm. arch that mm -hmm. I was talking about there by sort of almost thinking about keeping your toes straight but drawing the bit just like the ball of your foot towards your heel. And mm. so we'll go outside and we'll have Yeah, a yeah, that's what we're going to do right now. And that actually, it's a good opportunity to talk about the biggest mistake that people make when they're conditioning their feet. And that is that when people do these types of exercises, they only focus on the toe crunch. They don't focus on the, uh, the sole crunch. And the sole funny, crunch. the sole crunch. <laughs> um, and uh, until yesterday, when Phil talked about this, I actually thought to myself, wow, I've actually never focused on the sole crunch myself. I've only focused on the toe crunch. So let's get out onto the gym floor and have a look at some of this stuff. And this is, for those of you that have just tuned in, make sure you hit the like button and uh, leave a comment with your name and where you're watching from. But this is stuff that you can do at home right now that's gonna dramatically improve the strength of your feet, increase the uh, integrity of your arch, and uh, hopefully prevent you from having to get into a place. So Phil's on the mic. So I got the mic, we'll head outside and we'll get uh, Rad's just recently uh, pedicured feet. Yeah. No, they're, they're, really, they're really not there. Probably not. Um, Richie almost you know, cut the cord in this whole, um, this whole episode because we have to be zooming in on Rad's feet. They're that, that nice. But basically he's going to be sitting there on the bench and all these, um, we're going to start off by showing what the toe crunch looks like. So um, as he uh, pulls his feet forward by just using the, his toes, he can just inch forward and inch forward. Now this is quite a nice little exercise to get those muscles working and, um, and, and you do see that, that arch through there is, is building up. But then if we go back to the start, I wanted to show now the, um, the sole crunch. So the, the difference there is see how his feet are now staying uh, stable, so he's not walking forward, but this is just lifting up slightly. Now it's a bit less obvious in Rad because he does have quite high arches anyway. But um, what's happening is he's just pulling the ball of his foot there towards his heel and lifting up a bit through there. So um, to show what would not uh, be ideal is if you started to roll on the outside of your foot. So it's not about trying to walk around on the outside of your foot, but it's just a subtle sort of movement to draw that arch um, up. So keeping the toes, toes stable and just drawing up through the arch. Exactly. So this is just a nice way of really targeting into those structures without um, uh, because when you're, we're walking around, what you don't want is to then walk around with your uh, toes curled. As if Rad jumps up and was trying to maintain the arch just through that um, claw toe, then that's going to be really problematic for um, arch integrity. Because as I said, what we need is the when you're pushing off um, from your foot, it's that extension of your big toe that then tightens up the structures in your um, in your arch there to close pack the bones together and give you a really good leverage point. Mm. Cool. And of course, doing it sitting down like that is a, is a regression. It's an easy way to do it. You can also practice like uh, when I do it, I'm a little bit stronger than the average person. I do mine like this. So, so I that's do my, for the toe crunch. I do yep. my toe crunches like that. And then my sole crunch like this as well, where I'm just, you can't see, again, you can't see much movement here, but you can see that I'm trying to lift up the center of my foot and really push down here and bring the heel. Yeah, and pushing up, pushing it through the heel. And then the, you can add complexity to that and, and another progression by putting more weight through it by going on to one foot as well. Mm -hmm. And then you can be maintaining that while you're doing you know, single leg movements. So if you're going into a single leg squat, really trying to think about maintaining the arch, and that's gonna build nice stability up through your knees and into Yeah, your that's actually well. a really good point. That's something that I've always done. Um, I actually got taught that by my Kung Fu teacher years ago when I didn't have balance. And he told me, when I say years ago, I mean 20 years ago, and he said, just think of your foot grabbing onto the ground, like if you imagine what an eagle's claw would or a bird sitting on a perch. And so when I was standing on one foot and losing balance, just by that simple cue of thinking of my foot grabbing on the ground, it really locks you into place. It really does. But not so too clawed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not <laughs> you can see when I do it. I mean, look at my foot. Yeah. I'm not talking about grabbing onto the ground like that. Yeah. If you watch what happens to my foot. So I'm standing one foot. This is complete relaxation in my feet. And you can see I'm wobbling from side to side. Now I'm going to think of grabbing with my feet 
and you don't see much much movement but look at how much more stable i am yeah. if you if you're looking at my feet i'm still standing on one foot now if i relax I, as soon as i relaxed I, you couldn't maybe couldn't see it i immediately lost my balance and my foot wobbles around like that yeah and it's really nice one for as well if you're doing squats as, as well if you're, you're prone to kind of collapsing in with your knees if you're sort of not active through your arches there when you squat down it's quite likely that you come through your knees so if you try and maintain that arch and then sit back and down it really forces your knees up into that position. Now that's gonna be a balance between activation through your hip, but also activation through um, your foot. And that's just so key for when you're getting into sports or um, any activity where you're not, um, where you're having to step on one foot, land, walking up uh, upstairs. If you're collapsing in a lot, your knee's gonna um, come in and you're gonna have to do extra work with your hips. So it's mm -hmm. yeah. so a really good one for people to, to try at home. It's so easy to, to even do it at your desk while you're you know, at work, so. Yeah, those are those exercises are so much more valuable than you might think. They, um, um, yeah, honestly, it's been I've done very little of the more I don't know advanced way. I don't know, maybe maybe that's not the right, right way to say it. I've done very little when it comes to complexity with conditioning my feet, but I've done a lot of conditioning on my feet. Well, I think feet. the thing is you're you're doing more complexity than you realize because you're training barefoot yeah, every day. I guess so. so yeah. I guess I meant complexity is in different exercise selection. Yeah. I haven't. I don't. I never knew this wide range of exercises that people do. It was always really basic stuff like what we just showed then, um, and some stuff that we're going to show later on in this week as well. But I was active with it. I when I injured my foot and I was recovering from this surgery I did not just make a miraculous recovery from not doing anything I worked on this stuff daily uh, for, for like 12 months you know this was a big yeah. big thing and for as, me. as we've talked about with all the other you know joints in the body that we've worked through so far um, you know we're doing regressions and progressions for every exercise and now this is such a perfect one for um, you know if you haven't really if you've got sort of foot pain or you've um, you know had an injury or, or something it's it, this is like the starting point is just doing it when you're sitting there and then as I said you can build up that complexity by adding it into other movements that you're doing and um, when we're talking about sort of foot um, strengthening and rehab there's there's something uh, something I really want to make quite clear here is you've got the um, micro loading so these exercises which are specific to the foot but then you also think about uh, the macro loading, so what you're doing throughout the rest of the day that is going to be loading up your foot. And um, that's, you know, a large proportion of your day. So what you're doing there, what shoes you're wearing, um, if you're wearing shoes at all, um, you know, if you're going for a run, if you're training in the gym barefoot, like all of these things are going to really play into uh, the, the, the strength of your foot. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so Quok has asked a question here, would you trigger ball release the foot before these exercises? Personally, I would if you needed it, uh, but I wouldn't say um, you definitely would or you definitely wouldn't. Um, I think it's just a matter of trigger ball release for me has always been something that I've done when I feel like I'm getting cramps. So when I feel like I try to go into a plantar flex position and I start getting cramps under my feet, that usually tells me, oh, I need a little bit of trigger point release and I'll do that. Um, and that taking that approach personally for me has worked really well Phil what are your yeah thoughts? again like with um, trigger ball release what you I guess you're trying to do there is um, work on tight muscles and muscle spasms so if you're not used to doing these exercises it's more likely it would be kind of after you've done the exercises where they've if you've hit it really hard and they're you know holding on really tight and, and mm. feeling a bit sore or the next day you're feeling a bit sore from having challenged your feet a bit more then maybe use it there but again it's like I think people get really into um, stretching and release, whereas so much of this is about building structure and strength. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of people quack get a little bit caught up with trigger point release and with foam rolling. There, there's a there's a place for it, and there is, you know, I we use it a lot, and we teach it at Unity Gym, and we've got a lot of foam rollers and um, trigger point balls out there. But you have to think of the you know time invested versus the reward that comes from it, and if you've only got say maybe six, like 60 minutes for the average person to dedicate to their uh, exercise, their, their, their fitness, their workouts a day is a lot for the average person. So for the average person, if you had 60 minutes to exercise a day, I would put trigger point release quite far down the, the priority list unless it was something that you really needed, unless yeah. it was something that when you try to exercise, you get cramps and spasms, and by doing trigger point release, you can relieve that pain. And even in which case, it's like a short-term solution. It's something that you do, I've personally and with clients, I've found that 
um, a short spurt of doing trigger point release daily, maybe for two to four weeks is enough to usually relieve most problems and then be able to start working out. Yeah, and again, the beauty of it, you can do it uh, when you're uh, at the at a desk, yeah, you know, right. eating dinner, yeah. just chuck a golf ball or a trigger ball underneath you, underneath the desk, and while you're sitting there, just have a yeah, bit of a yeah. have a bit of a roll. So I think, yeah, really focus it when you've got time to train, like spend your time training, and then yeah, outside right. of that, put these in if it's helpful for you. Yep. Again, it's it's more about it whether or not it's helpful. For yeah, you. yeah, that's right. Because there's so much to do. Like I train for two and a half hours a day. And I still can't get through. I have to be yeah. very strict with what it is I do in my workouts because I just can't get through everything that I want to do. And that's in two and a half hours. So you've got to be really honest with yourself with how much time you're willing to invest in your training. And then if you are, you've got to come up with a hierarchy of needs and work through the things that are the most important first. Yeah. So I just want to come into again. So we're talking about the structure and the function of the foot today and, and how that relates to athletics is, I guess, that when um, people as I said at the beginning, sort of treat the foot like it's something totally separate. And I think that's kind of shown by, you know, you we put them in shoes and um, all of those kind of beautiful mechanisms for shock absorbing, force production and, and mobility all kind of get sort of taken over, especially like kids in school shoes where mm, it's just like yeah. you've got, you know, a horse's hoof like now instead. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, you know, dress shoes at, at work. So, um, so I think understanding the structure and function that you've got all these structures there that are um, able to really effectively shock absorb, really effectively can strengthen just like any other muscle in the body. They're all there. It's just we don't use them most of the day because of you know the the footwear that we you know grow up in and spend most of our time in. So again, these simple exercises are about transitioning from if you've had if you've if you've had any foot pain from uh, when you just try and spend some time out of the shoes or um, if you've kind of been on had orthotics for a long time. Um, and you're trying to figure out ways of building up the strength to get out of them, then this is a really nice place to start. And I think it's really important just to talk again about, um, I guess, when orthotics are a really good idea and the, the, you know, when you are seeing a podiatrist and they say wear orthotics, you know, that's, you've got to go with what the professional says there, but just, we just want to start that conversation and, and just have that idea that you, you know, challenge them and ask them, like, is there a plan for me to be able to be orthotic three and if that's important for you then you know push them on that and just ask like is you know have I got a death sentence of feet that don't work or yeah. is there a way that I can strengthen up my feet and get past this sort of situation yeah. so I think it's just so key to realize that you know there are times when they're really useful orthotics to get through something so when I had them as a kid it was for Sethers disease so I had heel pain from growing too fast um, but then the thing is that I was then never told of anything I can do to actually uh, stop wearing them so I had them for you know, just as long as I kept, uh, my parents kindly kept taking taking me back there and uh, paying for them, and and then it just got to the point where I got kind of sick of it when I was a older teenager and sort of figured out things myself. So, again, just making it really clear that like your your foot has these structure these structures that can uh, do the job of uh, orthotics, but there are certain things when you've got a condition or you know club foot or or some kind of um, longer term issue with your foot where it's yeah, important to had them for the sort of Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So I hope you guys got something good out of that. Um, I'm going to move into the questions from uh, the last 24 hours because we are out of time now. So Lance uh, Kolodzik on the flexibility training secrets, why you aren't getting results has said, great post, I'm guilty of the hardcore lifting mindset. A new way of thinking might help my mobility goals. Thank you. Thanks for uh, watching Lance and thanks for that comment. You, I can guarantee you if you're guilty of the hardcore lifting mindset with your flexibility training, then by you know scaling it back a bit and just taking the long approach, not going to that point of pain where you can't stretch properly the next day is gonna do a world of good for you. Uh, uh, um, uh, 1975, AWMA 1975 on our How to Do Skin the Cat full exercise tutorial is saying, I like it. Thank you, brother. Um, or sister, who knows. Um, Sean King is saying, uh, I sat in the deep squat for the entirety of the video. It's a brilliant tool and I'm trying to get my friend's family to learn to do it. That's on our best hip mobility exercises for the daily squat routine. That's awesome, man. Uh, it surely is a great routine and uh, it's a good... Um, it's a good mission to be on to try and get people around you to squat more. Um, now, Holy K Knight, I'm going to say, I don't know if you've tuned in today or not. I, brother, promised, um, I promised we'd give him a uh, shout out. I'm giving you a shout out for this one. Yanni's <laughs> highlighted this comment. And um, yeah, if you are watching, um, write something down in, that, uh, in the comments there. Because I'm going to say, I'm kind of a bit freaked out by this comment here because... Before I read this, I'm going to say the yesterday in yesterday's show I described how I did my injury, and all I said was doing an acrobatic movement when I was practicing 
um, 20 years ago. Now, the amount of acrobatic movements that are out there, um, there's just so many. And the one that I was doing is not commonly known at all because it's something that's unique to Kung Fu. And Holy has picked it. He said, holy shit, if you don't mind me asking, what acrobatic move were you doing when you did your Liz Frank ligament? Was it the butterfly twist? It was the butterfly twist. How the fuck did you know that? Um, and now he's saying, asking because the sport I train often involves training acrobatic moves on grass, sometimes on grass on or, or on sand, as well as the uh, pyro floor, gymnastic spring floor. And how common would you say that injury is and what's a good way to bulletproof your feet against common landing injuries whilst keeping good ankle flexibility? I am very passionate about this topic because of what I did to myself when I was doing acrobatics when I was younger. In my personal experience, injuries like this are very, very common and it's what ends so many young people with uh, young people's dreams because they uh, go into doing movements like this when they're not ready for them. And uh, I've, I saw a hell of a lot of injury. How many just in the foot? I don't know. Um, I think, to, to, to my knowledge, more of my friends injured their shoulders doing acrobatics, um, but a lot of people did their ankles and feet. So what can you do in order to bulletproof your body against it? This is my experience, personal experience. Acrobatics is something that's ruled by ego. I think a lot of people do acrobatics from an egotistical standpoint, and that's pretty much where it comes from. In my experience, you know, I wanted to do acrobatics because of how cool they were, and that's an ego-driven thing, and I'm not saying that with a negative um, connotation to it. I'm just saying I think that's what it is. And I think that what people do is one of two things. Either they don't warm up, one of three things, actually. They don't warm up properly. They don't do the conditioning before working on the exercises that's required. Or the third one is they try to show off or try to do something that's out of their realm of, um, out of their circle of influence, out of what they can actually really do. So how do you fix that? Number one, do proper warm-ups every session, never ever skip it. Number two, condition your body and don't just try and do movements. When you look at a movement, if you, the first thing you have to do is you have to break down the movement and think, well, what kind of strength and flexibility does this movement require? I didn't do that when I was younger. I had no idea how to do it. There was no internet back then. No, well, there was, but there was no YouTube or anything like this. Um, so I just tried to do the moves and I injured myself a lot along the way. And then number three, don't ever try and show off. Don't do something because you want to show to somebody else that you can keep up with them or whatever. And in my personal experience, if you Stick to those three things. Especially while drunk. Don't Especially while drunk. Don't show off when yeah, you're drunk. Yeah, Yanni fucked his shoulder by trying to do acrobatics. My worst out. my worst injury, Yanni's or one worst of my injury. worst injuries, I've got a mic, mate. Oh, one of my oh. worst injuries was... Um, the backflip off the wall when I was pissed yeah. uh, in a nightclub. Yeah, yeah. yeah. dislocating yeah. my shoulder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to be himself. like a bit. Uh, I, I love all you, the things you said there, Rad. But I just want to be quite clear there with like when you go into acrobatic moves, like you, you, it's a risky thing because the Very like at, li ligaments are there to hold the bones together, as we said, and there's no way that you can, I guess, bulletproof your feet. Like you can't make that ligament unbreakable, and if you did, it would just mean that you'd break your bone instead. So they're there as kind of like a give point. So you know, like y your body is not going to be able to kind of go past there. So it's, it is all about that technique and and preparation, as as Rad said. But um, yeah, th there's no like ligament strengthening protocol. You can load them and they'll get stronger like that. But yeah, you're just going to need to try and work up through complex movements to be able to yeah. do it safely. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot that goes into doing acrobatics properly and it's something that I didn't understand 20 years ago. Um, so SKWKR on our press to handstand, how to do a straddle press handstand for beginners video saying, great video, but isn't your pelvis supposed to go into posterior pelvic tilt during the floor exercises instead of the anterior pelvic tilt? So um, my experience is that you, because as you go into a posterior pelvic tilt, when you do the floor exercises, what happens is you're actually making it easier for yourself. So when you go into an anterior pelvic tilt, you're making it harder for yourself. And whenever you make something harder for yourself and you force your body to go through adaptation, you become better at the move. So if you're always making things easier for yourself, you don't force the same kind of adaptation that you do when you make things harder for yourself. Uh, another example of that is doing an RTO hold on gymnastics rings, a ring turned out hold. It is harder when you turn the rings out, which is why people do it. They do it because when you force that adaptation of making your body strong in that externally rotated position, um, you make all of the, um, uh, the passive and active structures in the shoulder stronger. So um, yeah, anything you wanna say about that, Phil? Um, just that I think that like some people, people get a bit too hung up on like, it needs to be like this or it needs to be 100% like that. Like the body is so, 
good at dealing with whatever you you do. So good like one, if you it. like, it is very a very resilient structure. So if it's if you know, as long as you kind of have the intention behind the movement, so you're trying to get that sort of you know ideal supportive movement, like it, it's like the body's kind of able to handle it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, now we're on to Sakari Polari has said on orthotic yesterday's video orthotics for flat feet. Hey guys, great topic. I've never worn orthotics, but I used to always wear shoes with lots of cushioning in the past. Had flat feet and my knees and ankles were not in good shape. But after starting to use barefoot shoes and carefully worked my feet strong enough to run comfortably uh, without heel striking for more than two kilometers, which took about three years. Good point. Took about three years to go for up to two kilometers, which is a very short run. My feet have never been in better shape. Still have some issues with my uh, right big toe not being able to curl when the ankle is pointed. Uh, left curl's fine. Cheers from Finland. Um, that's a really good point, and thank you so much for uh, for that for that feedback, Sakari. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, same on yesterday's video, Dave Baxter said, hey guys, your Rumble Roller Amazon affiliate link doesn't seem to be working. FYI, let me know when you get it fixed as I'd like to use it. I can't tell you how happy that makes Yanni and I to hear that our beloved um, inner circle are not purchasing things until they can do it through our Amazon link so that we can make six cents off the um, sale. Amen. No, I really mean that. It's, uh, uh, it means so much to us that you want to support us that much. So thank you, Dave. Um, I really mean it. That's a really, really nice thing of you to do. And uh, Yanni just, will get that. Just, just quiet, um, quietly, the way the Amazon uh, links work, for those of you who don't know, Amazon actually cookies you. If you click any of our links, Amazon cookies you and we get commission for any sale that goes through and for the next like 24 or 48 hours, I think it's 24 or 48 hours, unless you go back onto Amazon through someone else's affiliate link. So it's quite, it's quite an amazing system really. Uh, so if you, if you click through one of our exercise equipment links and then end up buying a microwave, we get commission for the microwave. How, how crazy is that? Microwave. Oh, yeah. Out, out of yeah, literally. I like we. I've I've checked our report. We make like twenty six bucks a month from the affiliate thing. It's pretty funny because the affiliate, the, the most of the commissions are tiny. But um, I've checked and like we get commission on like bras and like weird stuff, you know. And I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty awesome. So who knows when our when our, when we've got a million subs and this channel is just cranking, we might actually make a living off affiliates. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, I just wanted to say one thing on Sakari's comment, which um, Rad just walked through, which was the lady transitioning from very cushion shoes to running. Um, yeah, I think it's really good you took your time there and it sounds like you had a really great approach. Um, just something to keep in mind when with running, like not all running is equal. People develop their own styles just from, you know, because it's generally not something you get taught. Um, so there's just so much good information out there and work with a running coach or a physio is really into the running to give you some help on technique because there's uh, lots of different things you can change about your step length, yeah, your, your cadence and um, your foot strike that can make uh, running a whole lot more comfortable and, and easier. So if you haven't tried that, especially now you've transitioned to barefoot and uh, give it a go. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Really appreciate the interaction. Quok, thanks for all your uh, comments, brother, as always. And we'll see you tomorrow. We're going to be getting into some more advanced exercises for the last couple of days of this week. So make sure you stay tuned because, as always, we build on this topic and you're going to see uh, some much more advanced foot conditioning um, for you guys uh, tomorrow, Thursday and Friday. Yeah, I, I noticed that there's a few more people jumping on live, and that's um, probably because I stuffed up and didn't send all the um, the links out on social until yeah, just right. recently. So that's anyway, all, right. all good. Thank you. <laughs> Next time. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you all tomorrow. Health is about performance, not just body image. You better be willing to accept <laughs> so what you're going to have to do to get there. We'll start focusing on movement goals, strength goals, flexibility goals. When you nail that skill, it's there forever. The body image goal doesn't get you that It's far. the consistency and frequency that's going to get you there. It's not the intensity. There's no shortcuts to mastery and movement. Destination doesn't change overnight, but your direction will. The gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. We are the gym that teaches people how to move instead of just exercise because we believe that health is about performance, not just body image.